Uh, the speakers were, of course, top notch. Um, and uh, the uh, book room was, uh, had several different vendors um, that I spoke with. All of the Catholic Answers material were on uh, a discount. So I bought, I just bought a whole bunch of things. Lots of books, lots of DVDs, lots of CDs. Um, so um, what I brought here, I would like to share with you. First of all, um, I'm gonna actually keep that for, for newcomers. I've got two copies of the current issue of Catholic Answers Magazine. They were giving these out for free. Um, and it's a, it's a special issue. It's the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation issue. And inside um, is, here are the titles. Why the Reformation was necessary, but Protestantism was not. I like that title. Very good article by Mark Rumley, who spoke at the conference. Uh, timeline of the Reformation, remembering the Reformation together, how the English cinched the split, and from great evil, God brought great good, and the Reformation's toxic fruit. That's a very good title for that. Um, all of these speakers uh, are that were at the conference are in this issue with some extras. Uh, Jimmy Akins talks about remembering the Reformation together. Um, if you know nothing about the timeline of the Reformation, it's well worth getting. Uh, Jimmy Akins, uh, no, this is Mark Brumley's, uh, talks about how the Reformation was necessary, but Protestantism wasn't, and it gives you what, are, what uh, in church history we call some of the proto-Protestants. goes all the way back to John Wycliffe. It talks about uh, Jan Hus, or Jan Hus, the 95 Theses, what happened at the Diet of Worms when Martin Luther was condemned as a heretic, uh, what came after that, the Augsburg Confession, which is the first Protestant creed in 1530. Uh, Jimmy Akins talks about how um, Protestantism spread and what unites us and what separates us. Both are very good issues. So two lucky people will be able to grab one of these. If you want a copy for yourself, I would strongly suggest you go to Catholic Answers. And this is the current issue. So that's that. I also got a copy of the National Catholic Register. Um, I've already looked through it, so this is for anyone who wishes to have it. This is the new, the Catholic uh, newspaper that's put out by EWTN. So I would stand strongly behind its, its um, orthodoxy. Uh, in here also, I got a copy of the Magnificat, so if the ones Connie have aren't enough, there's another copy out here. For you, and the rest of this are mainly catalogs. I got two of those. Catalogs from Catholic Answers. I got um, St. Paul Street Evangelization. I grabbed two of these from Immaculate Heart Radio Bible references for Catholics. So if you want to, uh, if you want to know what does the Bible say about the need for good works, what does it say about the brothers of Jesus? Priesthood, worship, the Eucharist, uh, the use of statues, images, and relics. So here's good Bible reference sheet for that. There was something else in here that I grabbed that I thought was really good. Hold on here. I know it's in here. Oh, yes. I got $10 million. No, actually $2 million with Pope Francis's face on it. <laughs> this is from St. Paul Street Evangelization. I love these, I love these. These are witnessing tools. These are things that evangelicals have done for years. It's just neat to see that Catholics are getting in on the bag as well. So they're in here for you if you want a million dollars with the Pope's face on it. Um, oh, these are some great Flyers from St. Paul Street Evangelization about salvation and the good news. 
So I got those in here uh, about that. So I'll just leave these in here for after Bible study so that you can all swoop on them at your will and take whatever you want. I'm leaving this all here. Um, last week, the question was asked, what do I think about the, th the, the theologians who petitioned the Holy Father? And what was that all about? Um, I heard about it, but quite honestly did not know the details about it. I thought it was about some other issue that was brought up that was, uh, that the Pope might have been released or something that he had said. And so I didn't get the full story uh, when I answered last week. Uh, the answers I gave are sound, I would say. They're general principles that I would have applied. And I, I'm going to reiterate the same ones tonight. But I did look into the story a little bit more. Apparently, there are... Uh, there was a signed petition, what's it called, a filial, they called it a filial, oh, I can't remember the word, it's a filial something, um, in which there were a number of signatures on it, approximately 60, from various Catholic universities, confraternities, and so forth, petitioning the Holy Father for clarity on his most recent apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia. Moritis Laetitia. The one, the most recent, uh, it's not an encyclical, it's an apostolic exhortation. And they're asking for clarity, particularly on the, the apparent confusion that it, has, it is causing amongst Catholic faithful particularly chapter 8 of Amoris Laetitia, okay? And this comes in the wake, if you will, of several other petitions that have been given to the Holy Father. The most recent one before this was the four cardinals who presented the Pope with a, what did they call it? A dubia? <coughs> Uh, which is uh, the Cardinals asking the Holy Father for clarification on his apostolic exhortation. So it was like, oh, we're back to that again. I thought this issue was put to bed. Apparently not. There is apparently, uh, and, and it, maybe it's because it doesn't affect me, and, 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 it, it's, I, I, and I don't think really much of it. Uh, Amoris Laetitia, if you don't know what it is, it's the latest thing that Pope Francis published um, that talks about how to treat, amongst other things, uh, divorce and remarried Catholics and their ability to receive communion. And in it, it appears that the Pope is allowing for some to be able to receive communion who are divorced and remarried without receiving an annulment. And that's part of what the petition is about. It's like, could you please clarify what you mean, Holy Father, on this? That's the bottom line of it. So as to not promote, uh, or what seemingly is to promote, uh, confusion or error on, uh, uh, on your part. And uh, so far, the Holy Father has not responded either to the dubia or to the the theologians. Um, I, I, and I, I'm not about to interpret why the Pope is doing that. That's his, uh, res that's his business. Um, but again, I would stand by exactly what I said last week. For one, this is not an infallible teaching that he is giving. It is not fit the category, as I mentioned last week. It's not even, I found out later, Amoris Laetitia is not even an, an encyclical. It's an apostolic exhortation. In other words, it's a pastoral letter. That's another way of putting it. So it's not even up to the level of even an encyclical, which is a general letter given to the whole church. So right there, we're talking about how Pope Francis is feeling or trying to open the possibilities for 
pastors to make pastoral decisions at the pastor level rather than from the hierarchical level on unique cases. He's not revoking anything. He's not teaching anything contrary. Then why all of these petitions and stuff? Well, apparently other people are getting the impression that he is trying to change church teaching and that it is causing or has an appearance of confusion. And so they're asking him to exercise his authority, his teaching authority within the church and to just clarify what exactly does he mean in his exhortation. So that's the basic bottom line of it all. There's a lot more detail in it that I discovered. And uh, if, uh, if I were you, I would, go to the, I would go to the National Catholic Register article um, to, to look at that because it's in a question and answer format that they have there about this uh, that I found very helpful. Now, some of the comments on it, they felt that weren't very helpful, but I felt that the article was very helpful in clarifying what exactly is this issue and what exactly is going on. You can also get a copy of the petition, the most recent petition that went to the Holy Father about that. Um, by the way, is there any sin in petitioning the Holy Father for uh, clarification on a matter of faith? No. no. That is the, under canon law, that is the right of every baptized faithful. Every baptized faithful has that ability. Okay, so it's not just the privilege of bishops or cardinals, it's all the faithful have the right to petition the Holy See for clarity. In general, they don't, the Holy See doesn't answer a particular person's, like if I wrote a letter to him, please clarify this, because what will normally happen is say, talk to your pastor, because mm -hmm. that's your most immediate authority. The pastor isn't clarifying, and then you go to the bishop. And if the bishop doesn't do it, then you petition the Holy See, but there is a chain of command, if you will, you know, about this. Yes? What could be a special circumstance for divorced Catholics who remarry without an annulment? Ah, very good question. Um, if they are not fully conscious of what they're doing, if they didn't know fully that to be divorced and remarried um, was, uh, without an annulment, was a mortal sin, that kind of thing. If they weren't clear about that when they first got into it, which is not that unusual, then it would be up to the pastor to decide. Uh, so let me give you a scenario. Let's say I'm a lapsed Catholic and I've been lapsed for 20 years. I was married to someone, but we divorced 15 years ago. And I haven't really returned to the church. And since then, I've remarried. Okay. Not married in the church, just civilly, you know? And I didn't think much of it. Well, I have a conversion of heart, let's say. I've been listening to Catholic radio, I've watched EWTN or whatever, I've come to Chip's Bible study and I realize <laughs> that I'm in mortal sin, okay? I want to rectify the situation. I don't want to just divorce again my, the, this person I married, I really love her. What do I do? Well, there is a way that she and I could, if we're under the same agreement, this is something that's now involving a whole nother person. Maybe she doesn't want to convert. You know, it's like, you're a nut, Chip. You know, you're going off the deep end. I'm leaving you. Okay, well, that's a whole nother issue. <laughs> you know, right? Now I've got two marriages I've got to, I gotta get clarified. But let's just say, for sake of argument, she's buying all this, and it's like, you do what you want to, Chip. I'll, I love you, I'll still, stay, I'll still stay with you, right? I go to Father Gallagher, and I say, you know, I, I was married, I divorced, and uh, I'm now married to someone else, and we've been together for a couple of years, let's say, and uh, I've had a conversion, I want to I wanna come back to the church. Can I receive communion? Well, under a strict understanding of the church law, no, because I'm still married to that other person. And now I'm in a permanent state of adultery. 
Permanent state of adultery. Okay? Well, I just don't want to divorce. That doesn't seem right either. What do I do? So it's up to the pastor to decide if there's some way that I can live with this person as if we were brother and sister, let's say. Maybe in separate rooms or maybe even in a separate apartment. Until the matter is all resolved, then that might be grounds to allow me to receive communion under those circumstances. Do you see that? But that's a pastoral decision that's made at this level, not at the Holy See level. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, will that work with everybody? No. What if I say, well, I'm not going to move into another apartment. You just have to trust me that we're, gonna, we're not going to have sexual relations in the same house. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about you, but if I were Father Gallagher, I'd say, I know human nature a little bit too well. It's just not that easy to just do that. Now, maybe you've got an iron will, Chip, and you can do that. And Chip doesn't have an iron will. Let's just say that. Okay? And so it, it's going to present scandal if you go up to communion. I would like to... Have you do that, and I hear your heart, and I want you to continue to go through the process of annulment, and then later a, 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 a church a, a, a sanctify your current union's marriage, if the first one is annulled. Do you see what's happening now? This is the pastoral level that is giving rise to how to bring these on the surface, it just, well, they're, they're just wrong, they're evil, they're going to hell, they're in permanent adultery. Bye. You see that? And it's like what Pope Francis is saying is that there may be some situations that if it is judged well by the pastor could make for certain circumstantial allowances and still be with under the auspices of the church. You see, the whole point of Francis and his papacy, I've noticed, is that he's trying to, if you will, open the doors of the church to those who would otherwise feel that they were just cut off. All right, now this is causing some on the more, shall we say, conservative end of the church to just start to twitch. It's like, no, 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 he's breaking the law. 